to commas. Commas is all things tech. You see culture and technology coming together. Life hacks. The practicality right now in the inefficiency of the internet of buying and selling stuff is extraordinary. Entrepreneurship advice. I think the first thing is you got to understand your business inside out. Love and tech. We've almost reduced dating to kind of this very momentary snap of a person. It's going to be a fire show. I have yet to see something these days that's truly differentiated. New advice and new inspiration every show. It truly is about the next generation of creators going faster, further than we did. And now, Sequoia Blodgett. Now let's start stacking them commas. On this episode, we catch up with the founder of Curio, Devin Lars, and he talks about how he secured his deals with Nike and Tesla. And we touch upon why patience is absolutely a virtue. Entrepreneurship advice. <laughs> Learn from the hottest and most successful investors, founders, and innovators in the game. Determine your greatness. It's time to get your knowledge up. Okay, okay, for sure, for sure. What is popping? We got Devin Lars in the building. You're Founder and CEO of Curio. You've got so many dope things going on. I want you to jump into your background first for the people who don't know who you are. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited that we were able to do it. Me too. Um, I know we've been trying to plan on this for a while. So a little bit of background on myself um, from the Bay Area. Me born too. and raised. Me too. Hey. Um, grew up in Richmond. Me I know too. we both from there. Yep. Wait, where I went, in Richmond? I went, well, South Richmond. Okay, kind of. So yeah, yeah. Well. By Crescent Park. I lived in Crescent Park. Really? Oh, my God. You know where Fleming is? Yes. My yeah. whole family lived in Crescent Park. We are going like <laughs> That's way funny. off, you guys. And we didn't even know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, lived on Fleming. Um, and then in El Sobrante a little bit. Uh, lived with my grandfather um, when I was – I moved in with him in high school. Okay. Uh, and I Where'd was always – El Cerrito. Me too. When'd you graduate? Okay, two, we ain't going there. Two, <laughs> Continue. <laughs> 2005. Wait. Um, do we go to school together? No, you came late. Okay, 05. Yeah, 05. So I was okay, the, the last one in the portables. But right. so I I, I, um, I never really was like a, a, a good student per se. I never really liked school. Okay. Um, I learned, I had ADD. Mm-hmm. Like I learned differently. I like to do things instead You're of like creative. people, yeah, people telling me what to do. So um, my, my senior year in high school, um, I was messing up, uh, almost didn't graduate. Uh, my best friend graduated a year ahead of me. You okay. know Darian Webb? No. Okay, I got to send you some stuff. Okay. Um. So we we so he graduated a, a year ahead of me, and so he started airbrushing these model cars. Okay. Um. And I remember like I was messing up. I almost didn't graduate. My mom was like, you know, she was getting ready to send me to like boot camp and do all kind of stuff. Wait, do you know my sister Sierra? Sierra Robinson. Yeah. Oh my God, that's so funny. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, continue. For sure. Okay, we're <laughs> all connected. Catch up on your year. <laughs> we're all connected. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we we uh, I almost didn't graduate. You know, uh, we were getting ready to. My mom was gonna send me to boot camp and stuff. And you know, Darian said, you know, talked to my mom and said, let me work with them, right? And and I remember him sitting me down and he was like, you know, he was like the dad of the group, right? And mm-hmm. so he was always like super mature and and kind of like seeing stuff past where our immature mind was at seventeen years old. And so he was like, look, man, you're messing up. Like, what, what are you going to do? Like, you have to do something. Like, you're just going to mess your life up. Mm. And, and, you know, most of the time people say that, but they don't give you, like, a solution. Right. You know, they just say you got to do something. You're like, okay, well, what do you want me to do? I don't know. You need to figure it out. Um, but he was just saying, look, you know, we wanted, to, we wanted to start a business. That was something that we always thought about, right? Yeah. And this is in 2005. This was like entrepreneurship wasn't was really a thing. A thing. Yeah. No, it was you go to college and that's what you do. And so, uh, you know, we, I would go over to his house every day after school and watch him airbrush these model cars. And my girlfriend at the time was like, why don't you have him airbrush on T-shirts? Mm. And so um, I would go over to his house and, I, and, and he started airbrushing on T-shirts and then he would give me the shirts and have me wear them. And then I would bring him business. But I always liked art, right? And so I was interested in it. And I said, look, why don't I get an airbrush as well? And we go into business together. So I went home and I, I told my, my grandfather that we want to start this business and um, he basically got us our first airbrushing equipment, let us set up in his garage and, and on Fleming. So, you know, the area, you know, right. is, uh, is it, it has its challenges. Indeed. Yeah. And so we started airbrushing, uh, and, um, from there we wanted to get into like starting our own clothing company. Uh, but we knew we couldn't airbrush it. We needed to do production. So we found a, a screen printing class at Laney college and, 
we didn't know anything about screen printing, but we knew that was like the process of getting images on shirts. And we figured that, hey, we can print other people's shirts and then use the money to invest in our brand. Nice. And so we signed up for a, a screen printing class at Laney College. It was in 2008 when Obama was running. So okay. I know you probably owned an Obama shirt before. I did not really. But <laughs> you didn't? You didn't have the Obama? Everybody not. everybody had the Obama shirts, right? I was, it was out the Obama loop. Okay. Well, it was I a voted, thing. Though. I voted. Right? It was it was a thing. Everybody had Obama shirts, right? And so we, we ended up picking up business outside of class and nice. using the school equipment to print our first run of shirts. And the students were in there hating on us like... Why do they get to do that? We're like, dang, why are you hating? Like, we try to be creative. Trying to make a profit. Uh, you, you see what I'm saying? And so we were using that. The teacher was like, look, I could get fired if I get, you know, caught that you guys are, you know, making money in class. And so we had to pay her off. But, you know, we didn't have no money. So we had to give her shirts. And so we're like, here, shut up. <laughs> and so she was cool. She let us, like, be creative. Um, and then from there, you know, we, we ended up uh, leaving class. And we got an order from one of our clients. And we didn't have access to any equipment. So... We had to do like what entrepreneurs do and get creative. So we went down to Home Depot and got some wood, glue, and clamps and made a one-color, one-station screen printing press. And we used the fireplace from our grandfather's um, in the front room to lay all the shirts in front of it and use the heat from the fireplace to dry the first run of shirts. Wow. And so we dropped the shirts off, um, you know, at... <laughs> at the store and, and you know, he picked them up and he started smelling them and he was like, why do they smell like a campfire? So we didn't realize like all the smoke was getting on the shirts. So we realized we needed to do a better, you know, kind of step our game up, right? If we want to start a business. Um, and we, we really just had kind of an idea. Nobody would invest in us. You know, we had this fake business plan, you know, we didn't go to school or anything. So we just didn't know what a business plan was. Right. We didn't know real numbers. Right. Uh, but we ended up setting up in, um, our garage and my mom was on permanent disability. And so she invested in us and got us our first, you know, equipment, turned my room into our office, turned the garage into the manufacturing facility. And we got to work. We started to like network, pass out flyers. Um, Pink Dolphin Clothing was one of our like first clients. They were okay. still in the garage when we were printing for them. Wow. We started going back and forth to LA, started hooking up with different people, ended up linking up with some different celebrities, um, ended up like, you know, basically being there at a year and a half in the garage Moved into our first facility into uh, in Union City. Got our first employee. Uh, we were there for about a year and a half. Then moved into a larger facility. Started picking up accounts. Uh, used it to do like our own brand, and then also help you know companies with their promotional work. Um, and then in 2016. Uh, we ended up turning it into a full service creative agency. So helping clients online and offline with their brands. Super dope. And so that's kind of like the summarized version of the orange origin story of how we started and then to kind of where we are right now. I love that. I love the fact that you are super creative because I think a lot of people don't think about how to like I hear this a lot with entrepreneurs and they're like, I don't have the money. Yeah. yeah you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't understand like how to get their resources, especially if you're paying for school. Yeah. Right. For sure. If you're paying to go to any type of university and those are your dollars. Yeah. I don't care what anybody says. Yep. You paid for that printing press. Yeah, 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 right. For sure. So I think that having those resources and being able to utilize those resources are extremely important. I want to talk about how you leverage your relationships to mm -hmm. build out like Pink Dolphin. How mm -hmm. did you bring them on board? Mm -hmm. What was that process like? So it's interesting. So with Pink Dolphin, the way that that happened, um, that was all the doing from Darian Webb, right? My best friend. And so he was he was like my first mentor um, and he was all about like building relationships. And so he he led the relationship with that. He got us the account and everything like that. And he showed me like every step of the way of kind of like what he did and like just how he was like providing value. Right. I think the biggest thing is being able to show your value up front. And so he was willing to be able to say, hey, we're going to do this stuff for free. Um and just to get that account and to build that relationship. So that's kind of how we got the pink dolphin thing. And, and we've used that. Um, we used that kind of like philosophy to build all the relationships. That's how we've gotten, you know, Nike. That's how we've gotten a partnership with um, Tesla, uh, with um, uh, Nike, Tesla, the Warriors, uh, Cisco, like all the all the different clients that we've worked with. It's all been it's all been like heavy relationship driven um, kind of building with them. Nice. And what was one of your like biggest roadblocks in creating the business itself? Like what was your major roadblock? Like, oh my God, I don't know if this is going to happen type of situation. Well, honestly, myself, mm. I, I was talking to, I was actually talking to one of like my mentees and I was saying that, 
you know what's weird that I found out recently is I like, I kind of like chaos, right? I like fixing things. I like the rush of like something is broken and I have to fix it. And so I realized like what I would end up doing is sabotaging myself in certain things to fix the problem. Mm. And it was weird because it was like, it was messing me up because it was like, I was limiting myself of how, how far I can go. Um, and I, and I think everybody's, and I know it sounds corny, everybody, you know, hearing about like, it's yourself that gets in the way, but it's so true. Like, it's so true. Like being able to just be okay with yourself and understanding that uh, it's okay to feel stupid. Like a lot of people that I talk to are scared to step out and try things because they're afraid of like failing or they're afraid of like people judging them or they're afraid of what their parents or their friends are going to think. Um, and I think that that was in the beginning, not really the case for me. Like it it was still there that fear never goes away, but it's just doing it despite that. Um, so I think that that was the biggest thing. Um, I, I think another thing is just having patience uh, learning myself. I mean, I didn't know anything about business. I didn't have like business school, formal training. Like my parents weren't entrepreneurs. Like I didn't know what it was. So it was just like figuring all this stuff out as I, as I go. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think the biggest thing was just, um, just following a, a, a process, right? It's, it's a balance of having the creative side, but then also having the structure, right? You know, what was that mindset shift that you had to make? I just got tired of messing up. Like I just got tired of spinning my wheels so like so fast and it was just like I'm not like we're going we're going places but we're not really making progress. You know, like it's 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 busy work, right? And as I, as what I found and what I was thinking about, entrepreneurs get paid off of results, not time. Yes. You know what I mean? It's like based off of the outcome that you can produce. If you want to work 10 hours on this and you're super busy and feel like you're being productive, but you can get the same amount of work done in an hour, it's about results. You know, it's not about that busy work. So I just figured I'm like, okay, what do I really need to do to be able to like stop this busy work and really start to like build an organization? Because I'm a creative person, right? Business is like a, a whole separate thing. Let's talk about that. It's a whole different thing. Yeah, I think it's creative. It's so funny because when I first moved out to L.A., mm. I came out here to direct, right? So I wanted to create content and like that. This is before content was even called content. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, day in the life, right, not vlogs. Right, right, <laughs> right. Um, and so I think that as creatives, we don't learn the business side. Yeah. We come out and we're hustling and we're like, okay, we have to do this, we have to do this, we have to do this. And we're creating all this content. We're like, but my bank account doesn't yeah, reflect yeah, any yeah, of that. Yeah. So at what point was that pivotal moment where you were like, no, we got to make money. Yeah. Like scratch all the creative. It was It was hard, you know, because the thing is like, we always made money, right? Like we were always like, you know, we, we had our ups and downs and we had down downs, but it was like, I think it got to a point where it was just, if you realize if, if in order to really do something and I want like to do these creative projects and to launch them correctly, you need to have money for it, right? You can't be stressing about the bills. You can't be doing all that stuff. So I think it was just a matter of a process of figuring out, okay, what are, what are we building? You know, I, especially in the beginning, I was doing too much, right? From the outside looking in, it looked like I was doing a, a hundred things. Yeah. But I was testing stuff out to see what I liked, right? right. I was in my 20s. I was like recording videos, uploading uh, videos on YouTube before it was like, you know, when it was just cat videos. I was, uh, I was, you know, screen printing shirts. We were doing a brand. We were doing a bunch of stuff, but I was figuring out what am I good at and what do I like? But I think the real big shift that happened was when we got our COO on board. And she's very structured <laughs> yes. and she's very process oriented. So it rubbed off on me to say, OK, how do I keep the creative side, but then also put a structure around it? And so that is it's who you surround yourself around. And that was the biggest shift this last like two and a half years that we've had her on. Just learning the process part of it and seeing how she thinks and then her seeing how I think and then being able to work together as a team. You know, because you can't do anything alone. You right. can't do nothing alone. A hundred percent. I think like you're saying, you have to have solid team members yeah. because when you don't have the team, then you're yeah. like you have. And, and in addition to that, not only having solid team members, but hiring people who are smarter than you. Yeah, for sure. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to hire this person, this person. I'll train them up. No. Yeah, like yeah, if you yeah. want to succeed, you got to hire somebody that's smarter than you. Like it's so true. imperative. And, and, and smarter than you in different things. Right. You know what I mean? And, and what I realized is that it's like you can do something at 100 percent. But if you could delegate that same thing and get it done at 80, right, and then you can focus on what you're good at that nobody can duplicate, 
that's where your time needs to be spent. So I really realized like, okay, I need to start really spending my time on stuff that my team can't do. And then I need to delegate. And that was the hardest thing for me because I would like, I could do it better and quicker if I do it. You're like, I want to do it. Yeah, I just want to do it, right? And and but it doesn't it 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 doesn't do anything for the team collectively. And so, um, yeah, I, I think that's been one of the biggest things that I've learned um, along the way of just working with different organizations, um, seeing how different entrepreneurs like move, dealing with different business you know business owners and stuff like that. And I think it's just the the big part is having a team and realizing like you know, it's a business. Like you got to make money. Like you got to make money to pay the bills and the bills, the bills come around every month. Listen. And and it's like, you're like, damn, I just paid the rent. How's it back around already? Like it go, like the months start going quick, especially when you're a business and those invoices and the rent is due, you know? Yeah. And so it's, it's just about the process of just building and not, not giving up. It is not cool when you got more months at the end of your money. Yeah, that is a problem. Hey, for real. <laughs> I know that really well. Right. So I met you officially met you at the mm -hmm. Black Panther screening. Mm -hmm. We both were on a panel and you had done all the t-shirts yep. in the audience. So mm -hmm. talk about that process and like how that relationship came about. For sure. Um, um, so I was introduced um, through Julie Waters um, to Taj, who works at the Ace. Uh, and he is the VP of External Affairs. Uh, and we just kind of built a relationship Super cool dude. He was doing a lot of stuff in the community, really trying to make some change and really trying to integrate the A's into the community and really build that voice. And so he came to us with an idea to do a screening for um, the Black, Pan Black Panther movie um, and having basically buying out the theater in Jack London and having a bunch of youth uh, from different organizations come and see the, the movie and then also um, do a panel. And so I introduced him to a good friend of mine, Jason Maiden, who has Super Heroic, uh, an incredible, incredible, inspiring person. I know we you. Love Jason. Yeah, I mean, Jason is just when you talk to him, his energy he just makes you feel stupid when you're around him, I and you're just it. like you want to be yes. around him because he's so educated in the way he just articulates himself. And um, I, I connected them. I said, "Oh, I got the perfect person that needs to be on the panel." And so he hadn't heard about Jason. I introduced them. And the shirts were actually uh, Jason's idea from his company, Super Heroic. And so he, he was like, he came to me, he was like, hey, I got this idea. Why don't we do these shirts? We can collaborate on them. We did all the production on them. He did the design. Um, and then we passed them out to every, uh, every youth that was at the, at the screening. So it was cool. Collaboration and partnerships are extremely yeah. important. Like you said, you can't do it all, right? So talk about the partnerships that you've had, mm -hmm. and especially the Nike partnership, mm -hmm. because that's how you came back to my attention. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so talk about how you guys facilitated so, that. Yeah, so it, it, relationships are everything. I, I I really pride myself. If there's one thing that I'm I'm like I really pride myself on, and I'm I'm really like I really like, is is building relationships that last, right? Like. The thing is, you can tell how people are going to act when the check clears. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like after that check clears, are people going to call you back? Are they going to answer? Like, how do you build a relationship after that? That's when I really start building a relationship. Um, and so we've been working with iHeartMedia um, in the Bay and doing all of the radio station shirts from KML, Summer Jam, like all the shirts since 2012. Um, and so we've built up a tight relationship with the people at the radio station. So um, one of my homies uh, that works there has a brother that works at um, this agency in, um, in L.A. And they needed like 7,000 shirts done. Uh, I mean, long story short, we ended up having to print it in like two days and they were really impressed. We ended up meeting the Nike clients because Nike, they were the agency for Nike. We met the, the brand director of Nike um, and he was like, look, we don't have a partner in the Bay that we work with and you guys turn that around really quickly. And he was like, we would love to set you up as a preferred vendor. So anything that we do in the Bay area with the warriors and everything, we go through you guys. And so I was like, all right, cool. And this was when like when the, the warriors first went to the playoffs, you're like, that'll work. That'll I was like, work. that'll work. I got you. Right. And so he gave me his card. Now this is where it kicks in. Right. He gave me his card and I sent him an email, literally probably like an hour after I met him and I didn't get a response. And so I was like, all right, that's fine. I'm, I'm patient, right? I'm, I'm patient. You can ask my team. I'm patient. I will wait. And so then I sent him another one, maybe like a day later or something like that, checking in, nothing. Just saying like, hello, yo, what's up? Um, and then I sent one like a week later, a month later, and then no response. And that, like did not hear anything. Um, and I remember a couple of people I was talking to was like, oh, that's messed up. They should call you back. I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, they're busy. 
when they need something, we'll be there and they're we'll Nike. deliver. Yeah, they're Nike. Like, they're busy. Like, come on. Like, they're not checking for us. So, long story short, we ended up um, we ended up meeting with them. Um, and, and he finally got back to us after, like, a year, right? And so, I think what happened was I was emailing him, like, probably, like, eight or nine months straight. Like, maybe, like, once a month and didn't get any response. And so I was just consistent. I just said, hey, I'm going to be in L.A. Let's let's hook up for coffee. The brand director calls me on Friday night and says, hey, leave it up to Nike to call you for a last minute order. I said, whatever you need, we got you. He said, I need like 40 shirts done by by Sunday. I was like, all right. And he's like, OK, cool. I'm going to send you the shirts. We got it done, delivered. And he was like, dang, he they, like they came through. So I said, we're just my, my whole focus was like whenever they need us, we're going to deliver. And we're going to go above and beyond and make sure that they're taken care of. So we did it that one time and then didn't hear anything back. Like, hey, you know, you said we were going to get set up as a preferred vendor. Didn't really hear anything. They were busy. Another time they needed some shirts. Something happened. It was last minute. We got it done again and we delivered. So the third time that we did that, it was like maybe like a month, two months in between those times. Um, The third time that we did it. He was like, you know what? Like, I want to set you guys up in the system. And he sent us the paperwork. We got into Nike. He set up his preferred vendorship and all that stuff. Um, a goal of mine was when the Warriors first went to the playoffs, I seen all those shirts in the arena. And I said, we need to be doing that. And we didn't know anybody at Nike. This was before this whole Nike story, right? And I said, we need to be doing this. And I told my mom and I told my team, I said, watch, we will get an account where we will do an arena takeover. That's what they call it. So long story short, we've been building a relationship with Nike over the last like three years, have a great partnership with them. Uh, And then I got an email from the brand director in, uh, I think it was like February, early February, or no, no, it was January. It was like early Jan. Yeah, early January. And he was like, um, he just sent me a casual email. He's like, hey, Dev, uh, give me a call. I got a project for you. So I was on the team meeting. I hung up. I, I, I told the team, it was funny, right? I didn't know what the project was, but I said, hey, I'm going to get on the call with uh, with Nike and I'm going to get this arena takeover account, right? I'm just saying, I'm just speaking like, it into the universe, regardless right? Regardless of what they need. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, this is what we're going to do because I've been saying it. And so I, I get on a call with him. The, literally, the conversation lasted like 45 seconds. He said, yo, we're doing arena takeover. We need 23,000 shirts done. I'm going to send you the artwork and the blanks. I need you guys to get it done within this time frame. I said, say no more. And oh, then wow. I hung up and then we we just, we got to work. And so... Um, from there, it was like it was a really dope experience. It was it was front and back. It was for Black History Month. Um, it was for a campaign that were, that that they were doing. Every fan in Oracle got a shirt. Um, it said it was for a bigger campaign. that said until we all win. And so it was just it was really tight with that alignment because I've always been in a mindset of like I want to come up helping other people come up, and that's always been a goal of mine. Like I started speaking in 2012. And started speaking to like high school students and working with youth and just sharing my journey and my story of like what that is. And I remember I would like always push this positivity and and it was just, it was met with resistance because at the time people weren't trying to hear all that. I remember even my closest people, like business partners and stuff was like, man, ain't nobody trying to hear that positive stuff. But I was like, I know it's like, it's true to who I am, mm-hmm. right? That's authentically. It, yeah. And I said, this is what I want to do, right? We have a brand called doing everything different. And, and I like, I want to embody that. And so it was just cool to like that they chose us, uh, you know, during Black History Month until we all win the messaging. And it was just it was a surreal experience. We ended up, you know, doing that project, getting it done uh, within like we got it done in like a week and a half. Um, I think it was about a week and a half. They It ended up getting shipped to us a little late, um, but we got it done and we delivered. And it was, you know, I got to go to the game and um, we, we got to uh get the full kind of like experience. We we were on the court during the shoot off and just got to see the whole arena filled with the shirts. And it was just, it was like that vision coming to reality, right? Being able to see it when other people can't and then just being able to believe in it and, and keep going no matter what. And things, things will work. It's just, you have to believe, you have to put in the work and you have to believe in it and you just can't give up. Like you can't give up. That's literally the only thing that, that really of why I, I reposted, um, uh, a, a video clip from um, from Nipsey, man, like like a while ago, like maybe, I don't know, months and months ago. And he was talking about the thing that separated him was he just didn't give up. Mm. And it just resonated with me so much, right? Because it was just like, it's just so true. A hundred percent. It's like, it's so true. And 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 it just, it it, it spoke to my soul and, and, and it's so true. It's just like, that's the only thing. 
you just, people don't give up. The successful people just keep going no matter what is thrown in front of them. Yeah, that's real. And then obviously with you, there are so many gyms in that, first of all, but <laughs> I'll get back to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with you, it's not necessarily about like, like you can pivot, you can iterate, mm -hmm. you can change things, but continue on your path. Mm -hmm. I think that's the major key from that. And patience, mm -hmm. like patience, extreme, yeah. you are rejected yeah. no, multiple a lot of times. times. And that's not even, and that's not, same thing with Tesla, right? The way we got into Tesla, we emailed them for like almost two years straight and no response. And then we finally get a response. And they were like, hey, it's a similar story, right? They were like, hey, we we um, we have a vendor, but you guys are right across the street. We just want to talk to you. So we went in there. I went in there kind of like trying to get it, right? Like trying to get the account. And I realized I was getting meet with resist, like met with resistance. It's like, I was like, I had to fall back. I was like, let me just build the relationship. Yep. Like forget asking about the account. That stuff will come. Yeah. I built the relationship. The day that I went in there to meet with them, the only day that I didn't bring my computer and not talk in business, I brought them some stuff from our brand doing everything different. Is a day he was like, hey, I want to place an order, you know, and, and so that's when it really showed me like you need to put yourself in a situation that you need to operate in like abundance, like it's a lot out there versus like it's scarcity, scarcity like yeah. I need to I need to take this because if I don't get it now, I'm not going to get it. It's like, no, that like actually rejects things away from you instead of attracts it to you. And so once I had the mindset like I don't need this, but I'm going to be ready and prepared if it does come. Um patience right you just have to have it and, and nowadays with social media like i had to delete instagram off of my phone for a while because it was just like you get this instant gratification it just it messes with your head and sometimes you just need to take a step back and see what life really is it's not this stuff that you see all online a lot of the stuff is fake it's not real it's not the you you're you know you're seeing people what they want to post with the filters and stuff you're not seeing the grind so what i want to do is i like i really want to like start sharing more of the dirt and the journey than just the highlights and the success, because I think that's what a lot of people aren't doing. They're not being vulnerable. Like right. you don't hear people being vulnerable. They just talk about their wins. Right. You know, you don't hear people talking about, you know, I messed up or, you know, I didn't uh, take care of like a recent post I did about my credit, right? I didn't know how, I didn't know about credit. My credit was jacked up, right? I, I, I got back into a place that I needed to be. And I'm like, now I see how important that is. And I want to share that because coming from our community, you don't, you don't get that type of stuff. We don't under, we don't know, we don't get that education. And 100%. so, you know, just giving that stuff back and just like, that's, that's the goal and, and staying true. I love that you spoke about vulnerability because we have built this society of perfection. Mm -hmm. And I think showing up perfect all the time doesn't make you relatable. Yeah. Right. And so understand, like yeah, I saw yeah, your yeah. post on credit and yeah. it didn't make me go, oh my God, Devin fixed his credit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it made me go, how did he fix his credit? Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So it makes people interested in learning from you. Yep. And I think that's the direction that you should go. Right. Yeah, for sure. So speaking of credit, what were some of those tips that you used to fix your credit? Um, well, just being able to like, a lot of stuff, right? Just being able to set up, like, even if, if if you don't have credit in the beginning, right? Getting a lot of your derogatory stuff removed off of your stuff, stuff that went into collections that is just there. You can send letters. Like, they have services that you can send letters to get that stuff removed off of your account, especially if you don't have credit. Being able to get a secure credit card and making sure you pay on time all the time. Getting set up as an authorized user on somebody else's account. So if you have somebody that's able, that has a long history of good credit, you get on there as an authorized user, their history attaches to your history. Um, and your none of your bad history goes to there because you're an authorized user. So all of that stuff helps to be able to build and start the process of that. Uh, and I just think it's so important. Like if you look at the stuff of like having bad credit and then having good credit of like the money that you save and just being able to, even just being able to purchase some property or being able to um, uh, have a credit card or being able to buy a, a car, get a loan. You know what I mean? Like all of that, the, the credit plays a big part in that. And, and I think it's just something that I didn't take serious and I just messed up stuff. And like, especially in the, like in the beginning, I'm like, I don't care about this. Like whatever, I'll pay for it later. I'll let stuff go to collections. Like that stuff is going to come back and bite you in the butt. And, and it's stuff that's not talked about. And you know, I, I'm, I'm still learning, right. It's still a process of learning how this stuff is going, but like whatever information I get, I want to share. That's why I posted a video. It's this guy named um, Graham that posted it and talked about establishing a credit. A lot of uh, like, young younger people follow me right and and trying to start their brand and their clothing brand and stuff like that and so i just think it's so important for them to see that is going to be important if you want to get a business loan if you want to be able to get stuff you need to have good credit 
Like Period. you can't mess your credit up. And so he explains it, you know, that's his realm of Graham. And so I posted that. I'm like, hey, it doesn't have to be me. It's like if I find something that's helpful, that's coming from somebody else, like put that person like this is it's just about the information. Right. Right. And it's about being able to build that out. Extremely, extremely informative and quick like fact, because I just figured this out. You can put your rent on your credit. Yeah. So you can put your rent on your credit. Yep. And I just did this literally two months ago. Yeah. And my credit score went up 30 points. It, it helps. <laughs> and, it, and it's a process, right? You got to be patient with it. Yeah. It's not like something that's just going to jump up overnight. That one did. I was but, like, oh. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it hits that, you're like, okay, I like this. I, yeah, yeah. You're like, okay, cool. Like, wait a minute. And then even like, even people don't understand, like even when you go and like um, apply for credit cards, that knocks off points off of your credit. So if you're doing that all the time, that starts like knocking off like three to five points, I think, something like that. Um, but I just think it's it's very important to take serious. And I just really wish... And I'm trying to tell everybody how important it is, especially starting out. Because if you're 17, 18, 19, 20 right now, like you are in the perfect position to be able to get on as an authorized user from your, your family or even just get a secure credit card and just make those payments and don't be late. Because I promise you, you won't regret it. Like you're going to save so much money in the long run. You'll be in a position to of, of ownership. You know, like that's the that's the thing. It's ownership. Ooh, I just did. Actually, our last episode is all ownership. Yeah. Because that is literally the key to financial freedom. 100%. 100%. You had a question on here earlier. Somebody asked you, when I say on here, I'm talking about his Instagram. IG, live. okay. Somebody asked you about starting a personal brand or a clothing mm -hmm. brand. What are tips that you can give that person? So I would say um, starting a, we'll, we'll do both, right? Starting a, a, a personal brand, I guess, it's more so of just being yourself, being authentic. Um, I think even with with brands, right, your brand needs a face, right? Clothing brands. Now it's so easy with technology and everybody has a clothing brand, right? Like what's going to separate you? What is going to be different than everybody else? So what I try to tell people is like tie your brand to either a niche or something that that has an audience that you can speak to. Right. Not these fads. I see a lot of people come in and they just want to do what's trending. But the thing is, if you do what's trending, you're going to always be late because that trend was made a long time ago. So if you're trying to get in with the trend, you're going to constantly be catching up and you're not going to set yourself apart. So I, I just, I, I recommend, um, for anybody that's starting a brand, um, do a lot of research, do, um, find, find something that is authentic to yourself. Like with the doing everything different for me, right. Cause I could only speak on what, what it is, is that this was authentic and it was just a reflection of what it is. So finding a tribe of people that believe that same thing that you believe and then creating product to support those people. Um, and having something like that has been my experience, um, with how you build just, you know, different product lines and different stuff. And I've been around with like helping launch different products, right. Being behind the scenes of like doing stuff. And that's how you see people doing it, right. They do a lot of influencer marketing. So not just finding the person with the most followers, but finding the person with the most valuable followers that fit your mission. Like you can go after somebody and give them some of your shirts and they wear and they have a million followers and get no results right? versus going after somebody that has 3,500, 1,500 loyal followers that really fit the brand of your message that will wear the stuff for free just for getting the stuff and you will get some sales from it versus the person that has, you know, 2 million followers that doesn't align with it. So it's not about the numbers. It's about the, the quality of, of the person. Um, and I would say putting content out you know, recording content, putting content, documenting your journey, showing, I wish, you know, so many of my, like two of my hard drives got deleted of all my stuff of like from the beginning, I like die. in the garage and all this stuff. I'm like, I just like, even with the Tesla order, we had like a, a 30,000 piece order from Tesla. A lot of my stuff got deleted. So I would just say like document your journey and, and, back it up. and, and yeah, and back. Yeah. And, and use iCloud or something because <laughs> I was so pissed. Um, but yeah, just just being able to do that. I think those are the the, the best tips. Um, you know, do your research. There's a lot of information online. But then the the thing is, it's about action. It's just about doing. A lot of people. Um, we were we were talking about that on the way here. Of just you know, a lot of people feel like they're doing something by buying a course or 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 getting some sort of mentorship or watching a video. When in reality, 
it makes you feel like you're doing something, but you're not getting those results. So it goes back to, like I said, it's not about the the time that you do. It's about the results that you have right. so that you make as an entrepreneur. So get out there and test it out and try, like print some shirts, use there. I mean, there's so many different resources. I mean, on my channel, I have, I, I'm pretty sure most of the people that follow me know, but we, I put together a free course of like how to set up your online store. Like use technology. Like you can set up an online store literally in under an hour and, and design and set up your products to sell and you don't have to print any inventory. If that was around when we were coming up, like you literally can put all your, you can have a thousand designs and don't have to print one shirt and you get paid every time there's a sale and then the company prints it and ships it to your customer. Like <laughs> utilize technology. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like especially in the beginning. Now it's a give and take, right? You're not going to have as much, uh, you can't customize it as much as if you did it on your own or went through a different shop. But there's there's gives and takes. If you're in the beginning and you don't have any money, this is the best way to start to test it out to see what people like. So if you see a design is doing really, really good, now you can print that design and then sell it online. So now your margins go up. So just testing stuff out and putting it out. But nowadays, like when people say they don't have money to get started, especially when it comes to like a clothing brand and, and a lot of stuff, we have the Internet. You know, we have the Internet. We have so many softwares out there. You just have to do your research and put in the work. I love that. And I love that you pulled that back into ownership because that's yeah. literally a business. 100%. A lot of people don't understand. Like, you don't need a lot of money to start a business. What, that takes, what, $100, $200? I mean, with the literally most? to set that up, uh -huh. it, it would be you, you could get a 14 uh, day trial with Shopify. You're like, it's free. <laughs> like, it's free, right? But in order to sell stuff, you have to pay for it. But it's $29 a month. Right. Literally, like, you can pay $29 a month and have your whole store set up. Wow. But $29. Like you could take 20, you could get 20. If you can't get $29, you don't need to be in business, right? <laughs> like you better go cut some lawns or do something. You get that $29 and you set it up and now you have your store set up. You know what I mean? And, and now that's kind of like, now you have your foundation. And now from there, it's about building on. You know, a lot of people say that they want to buy screen printing equipment to print their own stuff. We've been down that road. It's not as easy as people think. You're not going to get equipment and be like, oh, I'm going to start printing stuff. We, it's, It just doesn't work that way. And so use technology, utilize the resources that are out there. Um, utilize, you know, technology is just, it's just incredible. There's, there, there should be no, there's no excuse of, of why you can't make anything happen nowadays. That's real. We're too connected and too many resources. So real. What's next for you? <sighs> what is next? Um, we are, so we are doing a few things. Um, we just got a, a new creative space in Oakland. So we're really excited about that. I think on the, on the sense, I mean, the business side, I mean, we're growing that. We just got a big contract with a, a, a really good client that we've been working on, and, and we just got that. So we start that May 1st. Um, so looking forward to that. So my team has, like, been prepping, uh, getting ready for that. Uh, and, and I really want to focus more so on, like, putting out content, not just building my agency. Um, it, it was kind of weird, right? And, and this is a quick story because I know we're wrapping up, but um, – and I'm not just saying this. Anybody that really knows me knows a about this and how much it impacted me. But with, with the whole Nipsey thing, right? Like Victory Lap was on repeat. That's the only thing I listened to from when it dropped to like for the whole entire year. Anybody know? They would always talk about like, why are you just? And I, and I, I told him, you don't understand what he's talking about. Mm. You don't understand the message that he's talking about. And so it was weird before the whole thing happened with him. I kind of took a step back, right? I, I deleted Instagram off my phone. I stopped putting out content. I started really just focusing on my business, just growing, got kind of getting insular and just focusing on that. But then I realized like he's not here anymore, right? But his message and everything that he put out in the content lives on. 100%. And that's the only thing that we got at the end of the day. So it re-inspired me to really like, I got a mission of why I'm here. Like, with the whole marathon continues thing, like I like I need to do my part, you know, and it and it and it pushed me in a in a way where I'm like I need to be doing more, and I, so I really want to. I'm really that the reason why we got the creative space and all this stuff is like I really want to start putting out more content of just like sharing the real authentic stories that can help people because that's the only thing that's gonna live on, you know. We 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 all have our time and and. And when we are, when that story is over, it's like the only thing that we have is the works that we did while we were here. So really focusing on that. So that's like, that's really exciting for me for, for next steps. That's what's up. So how do we find the content that you have out now? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, all my platforms, I've been lucky. I don't know how, but everything is under my name, just Devin Lars, D-E-V-I-N-L-A-R-S. So YouTube at Devin Lars, Instagram at Devin Lars, Twitter. I'm not really on it at all, to be honest, uh, but it's at Devin Lars and then uh, LinkedIn as well. 
Uh, and yeah, I mean, th like I said, the only thing um, that I, I really want to push, especially this year and then moving on to 2020, is just really trying to create a community of, of, of people that are pushing that positivity and paying things forward, right? I've been, I've been blessed to have a lot of people in my life that have given me a lot of game. And so it's like, it's about paying it forward. So the only thing that I want people to do is just start paying it forward. Like I'll, I'll give free resources out, whatever you need. People send me DMs all the time. I try to send it, but like, just, just pay it forward. That's, that's, that's the message. It's life hacks. Life hacking, baby. Tech tips and tools for everyday needs. Tap in. Control copy these shortcuts and simplify your life. You heard us. You heard so I think Devin touched upon something super important in his interview, and that is patience. And I think a lot of us going through our entrepreneurial journeys, we expect things to happen in our time. And that's just not how the world works. When I was directing commercial music videos, I had the worst patience on the planet, right? I would literally hit labels up and be like, hey, where are we at? Even though I had an agent and a rep who should have been doing all of it anyway, like I tried to circumvent the system. I'm like, where are we at? Like, have we booked? Are we not booking? Like what's going on? To the point where I remember a woman from Universal Republic, she was the commissioner and she literally, there was a video that I wanted to book really, really bad. And I hit her up and I was like, hey, you know, it had actually awarded and I wasn't aware that it had awarded. And then when it didn't award to me, then I was like, well, why? Like, can you explain why that didn't like why I didn't get that video? And she was like so upset by this. And I didn't understand at the time, but I'm very clear about it now. She was so upset by this. And she literally hit my agent and the manager for the artist and was like, why is Sequoia acting like this? Like, why is she not, you know, being patient? And like, why is she being super overly like aggressive and like all these things? And I was just like, because I just want to know. And I didn't know it was a negative thing, you know? And I think as my career has gone on, I'm understanding very much so with any of these like creative jobs, entrepreneurship, especially if you're in the fundraising space, None of it has anything to do with one particular person. That person might be facilitating the deal or that person might be the person who is awarding the job if you're, you know, obviously in the creative space. But there are so many chefs in the kitchen. There's so many people that you have to get a yes from in order for something to move forward. So patience is an absolute virtue when it comes to entrepreneurship. I mean, this shows itself in everyday life and relationships, everything, right? Like when you're not patient and let things happen organically, and I can speak to this because I'm guilty of this too, things just don't happen the way that they're supposed to happen, right? And so I really feel like having that patience and adapting that kind of mindset or adopting that kind of mindset will get you so much further than not being patient because when you're not patient, it comes off as super desperate, right? And nobody wants to interact with somebody that feels desperate. Like it lessens your value. It puts you in a situation where the other person sees you as a lot less valuable, which, you know, obviously you don't want to be positioned as. And in addition to that, it just, it makes your behavior erratic and aggressive and like all these things that aren't, positive attributes that you would necessarily want somebody somebody to see you as right and so I just think that going through the process of being an entrepreneur we have to we have to understand patience we have to adhere to our own values and if it's something that is totally bothering you and you can't be patient and you're feeling all of these things this anxiety you're trying to push a deal forward all of these things just take your mind off of it go do something else Focus on another part of the business, focus on growing the revenue in the business, focus on the customer base, focus on creating relationships and partnerships outside of that, you know, deal that you're waiting for. Just do something else, right? Because eventually the universe, when alignment happens, will let you know when the situation is supposed to be what it is, right? But if you continuously knock, 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 then they're just not going to answer. They're just going to be like, you know what? I'm good. Right. And they're just going to back away from the situation completely. So my advice to any entrepreneur who's out there who's trying to grow their business is just really be patient and understand the dynamics of the relationship. And it's not about just that one person. Like I said earlier, it's a team effort. It's a lot of people making decisions. 
And once you understand that, then you're going to operate in a different space. So you don't want to operate in the space of scarcity. You always want to operate in a space where there's an abundance happening, right? So having that scarcity mindset is going to make you not patient. It's going to make you desperate. It's going to make you think that, you know, if you don't get this, you're not going to get the next thing, right? Or you're going to always have just kind of this, I need to catch up. I need to catch up. I need to get to, you know, the next thing because it's not going to be there. It's just not a positive place to be. So I would say definitely understand that there's tons of abundance because there really is tons of abundance, like no joke. Like when you understand how much abundance there actually is, it's insane. So understand that there's tons of abundance, lots of resources. Everybody has an opportunity if you do the work and if everything is in alignment the way that it's supposed to be, the opportunity will present itself. Just like Devin said in his story earlier, that was insane to me that he took two years, two years to get that relationship with Tesla, right? And he has another relationship that's huge that he didn't talk about on the show, but I know personally what that relationship is. And that's a big deal, especially in Silicon Valley, especially from somebody coming from a city that we're from, Richmond, California, which is like a conversation all in itself. But for him to be in bed with this client is amazing. So practice patience, make sure that you're operating from a space of abundance and you will definitely get what you're looking for as an entrepreneur. This is the plug. You know who's the plug. It's time to get caught up on the hottest in tech. Keep it locked, you heard. With Sequoia Blodgett. I see you, little mama. I launched my first company, 7 a.m. in 2014 after a long stint of working in the entertainment industry as a commercial and music video director. It was hard. Even though I was venture backed by one of the biggest VCs in the game, I still was so confused as to how to actually run, grow and scale the company. I didn't understand how to convert customers quickly and efficiently. I didn't understand which marketing tools to use and how to create sales funnels. I didn't understand staying niche in the beginning and not boiling the ocean. I didn't understand how to stay motivated during extreme times of loneliness and not getting the results I was expecting. After several years, we ended up closing the doors. I started studying hundreds of really successful entrepreneurs to find out how they not only kept the lights on, but were scaling rapidly. After officially walking away from my first company in 2016, several years later, I launched Commas a virtual entrepreneurship resource center. Yes, we're actually a company. I built it to help you guys understand why raising capital too fast will actually hurt you, why you need a team around you to iterate quickly and stay sane, why your business has to stand out because so many people are doing the exact same thing. There are no new ideas and why it's important not to push your personal life to the back burner. Consider commas as your entrepreneurship resource guide so you can avoid making the same mistakes that I did. We cover all things from product to marketing to publicity and fundraising. You can learn more about commas, the actual platform, by visiting commastheseries.com. You can also hit us up on our socials at commas the series. Until next week, it's your girl Sequoia, and I'm out. 